in the headlines to the CBC Newsnight. The Barbados Workers Union appalled by layoffs at Wyndham Grand Resort, which defends its action. Employers encouraged to retrain staff given the widespread use of artificial intelligence. The Speaker of the House of Assembly questions the commitment of Commonwealth Parliaments to improving transparency. And in sports, six surprise call-ups for national duty at the CONCACAF Nations League. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC Newsnight, starting now. Good evening and welcome to the CBC Newsnight. I'm Wendy Burke. The Barbados Workers Union is tonight calling out the Wyndham Grand Barbados Sam Lord's Castle Resort for reportedly laying off scores of employees. The union is questioning the motive behind the move at this time, despite positive projections for the industry. However, the hotel has defended the action taken. Sharika Griffith has been following this story. The Barbados Workers Union says as many as 150 Wyndham Grand Barbados employees could soon be on the bread line. The figure has been disputed by the hotel. However, according to a statement from the union, the company has blamed the action on low occupancy rates and the need to streamline operations. But BWU General Secretary Tony Moore says this contradicts recent statements made by the president of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, Javon Griffith. Griffith reported that, I quote, early forward bookings from major source markets are exceeding 2023 by 18%, and that from January to June 2024, the island welcome. 381, 997 stay over arrivals, a 15% increase compared to the same period in 2023. So who are we to believe? On the one hand, we have the governing body for hotels painting a rosy picture for the coming months. And on the other hand, two major hotels, Sandals and now Wyndham Grand Barbados claiming such dire financial straits that they must dismiss hundreds of hardworking Barbadian citizens. Ms. Moore alleges that workers had recently been assured there would be reduced hours, but no layoffs. They agreed enduring the hardship of reduced paychecks only to be blindsided and betrayed with sudden redundancies without warning. The way these redundancies were conducted, in fact, reveals a shocking lack of empathy and a blatant disregard for basic decency. Imagine workers were not only dismissed without adequate notice, but were humiliated in the process, forced to return their uniforms and followed out followed out by security as if there were criminals. But in a further development, the resort is denying the scale of terminations, noting only 35 of the more than 400 employees had been given their walking papers. CBC obtained a copy of the letter. Public relations consultant Joanne Haig explained why the hotel decided to take the action. We're not in the tourist season that starts in December. So the numbers obviously are low in keeping with what we're seeing right across the board of most of the hotels, and that is the reason then for the termination. We're hoping then once the numbers improve uh, for the season, individuals, as stated in the letter, will have an opportunity to reapply. She also responds to the union's charge that workers had previously been assured they would not be laid off. That meeting that took place a few weeks ago it, all, it said that this is what will happen. We will look at reducing uh, the hours. If, in fact, the numbers of the hotel remain uh, the same, or should I say even some lower, then other measures may have to be put in place in order to reduce the, the payroll. And that was what was said. Uh, but it wasn't written in stone that this is the only thing that we will do. We said this is what we are going to do. Are we going to carry it for as long as we possibly could? Ms. Haig says at this stage, further layoffs are not anticipated, but acknowledges the situation depends on the trends in occupancy levels. Sharika Griffith, CBC News.
Employers are being advised to retrain their staff as more artificial intelligence is employed within businesses. The advice comes from President of the Human Resource Management Association of Barbados, Inc., Nicholas Roberts. The human resource consultant was speaking during the launch of this year's Human Resource Management Conference. It will be held under the theme Human Tech Expo, bridging the gap between people and technology, set to be held on October 9th and 10th. Yes, a lot of jobs are going to become redundant. A lot of jobs are going to become useless due to technology, due to AI. But through jobs becoming redundant and becoming useless, and I use useless very loosely, loosely, how is it that we then are going to train our staff, train our people, train the people of Barbados to meet the needs going forward? Because once those jobs go away, you're going to have new jobs that are needed. Additionally, Mr. Roberts says companies need to embrace remote work more. He says following lockdowns forced by the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of businesses reverted to a return to the office, which, in his opinion, is the equivalent of taking five steps backwards. There's still a lot of work to be done, and it is not only in Barbados, because if you look internationally, you're saying that many of the international agencies and companies that would have heralded great work from home policies would have reverted to, to pre-COVID in terms of asking people to come back into the workspace. But if it's the case that you have the technology in place within your business and your, your people can work from home, I don't see why you can't have a 50-50 split or however it is that works for your business to say that, you know, you work from home some days, but some days you're in the office and have that hybrid model as opposed to asking people to be fully in the office. The Speaker of the House of Assembly, His Honor Arthur Holder, wants steps taken to improve security for parliamentarians. He drew attention to the matter at the opening of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, or CPA's 46th Conference of the Caribbean and the Americas and the Atlantic Region in Guyana. Mr. Holder says countries should not have to wait until a parliamentarian is assassinated before taking vital steps to improve security. The Speaker, who is the chairman of the CPA as well, also questioned how many parliamentarians in the Commonwealth want to strengthen vital committees and improve transparency. We speak of issues of transparency and accountability. How many of our parliaments really want to, to strengthen the public accounts committee to ensure viability? How many? We can count them. How many of our parliaments, for example, want to expand selective committees? So as to really get in and zone in on this thing called accountability and corruption. We speak a lot of AI, of artificial intelligence. How many of our parliaments have encompassed ways to really fight arti ar artificial intelligence and, and counter things on social media? Oftentimes we do not. Mr. Holder wants parliaments to be more inclusive and embracing of female parliamentarians and the disabled. How many of our parliaments are really interested in making gender equality and gender parity a reality? How many of us? Do our parliaments, in truth and in fact, put up female candidates in constituencies that they can win and become members of parliament? Or are we purposely putting candidates in areas that we know the can so as to satisfy a quota? How many of our parliaments are looking at inclusivity as it relates to people with disabilities? Are we serious? Have we done enough? The Queen Elizabeth Hospital has welcomed plans to increase the nursing complement at the institution. Last week, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley announced plans to create 289 posts over the next two financial years at a cost of approximately $11.7 million. Chief Operations Officer of the QEH, Dr. Christine Greenwich, says the nurse practitioners in particular will be a big help to physicians and ultimately patients. She was speaking on the Pulse radio show on Q100.7. FM. Her efforts in working with us, in working with the Nurses Association to recruit uh, some nurses from Ghana will be a big, tremendous help in terms of our ability to staff safely throughout the facility.
Indeed. Uh, and and let me just mention, um, she mentioned a nurse uh, practitioner. She mentioned also clinical nurse specialists. And these are advanced levels of nursing practice. But primarily, the nurse practitioner is a role that we really need to engage as quickly as we can get our nurses trained. What they can do is that they can prescribe, right? They can prescribe, they can assess, they can diagnose, and they work hand in hand with a physician to um, take on a case load of patients. Coming up, a festival focused on highlighting the importance of the arts. The United International Arts Expo Festival was launched today with the purpose of boosting and developing the arts locally. A press conference was held at, for the event at Oto Beach Club. There, the media was told there will be a range of activities at the festival which are developmental in nature. The preservation of cultural heritage, especially the performing arts, will play a major role, and the founder of the festival, Carlos Cobham, intends to help open up avenues for the artists. One of the main activities will be the Walk for the Arts on Saturday from 6 a.m. in Warrens near the BCMI building, and it ends at Botanical Gardens. Walk for the Arts Barbados is really, really important and pivotal for the United International Arts Expo Festival because our theme is Art Matters. We want everyone to understand that Art Matters right here in Barbados. So let me everybody say Art Matters. Art Matters. That's right. So we want the arts to matter right here in Barbados just as we value tourism and, you know, even education. Uh, we, we can definitely learn um, through the arts as well. Um, you know, I would have done some plays even with our very own Simon in the past, you know, um, with theatrical productions. And we learned through that process. The festival was endorsed by President of BACA, Sean Apache Carter. We have some of the best vocalists here on the island. And we have some of the best musicians through, throughout the world here on the island as well. And, you know, initiatives like this are more than welcome. For a very long time, again, we've been saying that there's a need for more festivals outside of our major festival, which is the Proper Festival. So I think the initiative not only for the, the walk for the arts, but even as it relates to the Arts Expo Festival, is an excellent initiative. The Sanitation Service Authority is aiming to improve garbage collection, which has slowed for some communities. Public Relations Officer Carl Padmore is assuring the public that the SSA is getting back on track. He says the aim is to ensure households do not go a week without garbage collection. We still have a case where a number of vehicles are um, in the workshop, but there is a collaborative work going on among the depots we're sharing trucks and we're trying to bring down the backlog and we want to thank the sanitation workers for that the supervisors the superintendents those loaders and drivers they are working around the clock to reduce it so the complaints they have come down a lot we know the issue is still there and we want to give Barbadians the assurance that we are not going to compromise their health by not picking up the garbage once trucks are available we are moving around Concerns have also been raised about the increase in illegal dumping. Mr. Padmore called out those engaged in the act as he made an appeal for an end to the practice. If you go to Robinson Close in Kefil, you would see that over 20 loads of waste is underground. And persons, if we understand that it's just like three miles from there to the landfill, we want to urge Barbadians please to desist from this. It's the rainy season, and once this waste gets into the drains, and also when these containers get water, then it's a breeding ground for mosquitoes. With Africa CARICOM Day fast approaching, Barbados intends to use the celebration to foster Pan-African consciousness among Barbadians. Ambassador to CARICOM David Comachon says the day will be observed on Saturday with two major events. The first activity, a flag-raising ceremony, is slated for 10 a.m. at government headquarters on Bay Street. Ambassador Comachon provided further insight into activities on the Conversations on CARICOM segment of Morning Barbados. We will have high-level representatives of all three entities uh, that will give remarks. We will have cultural performances. 
So I want the word to go out that um, the place to be on Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, to, to witness this, um, what will be a very impressive uh, flag raising ceremony, the place to be is um, government, government headquarters. And then in the evening, we will come right here to CBC where we will have um, a live television program where we will be talking all things Africa, all things Barbados, CARICOM, connecting with Africa. Sports time now, and we say good evening to Damien Best. Good evening to you, Wendy. Good evening to our viewers and listeners. Some football news first up. Several big names have been left out of the Barbados senior men's national football team as the Tridents prepare to battle against Bahamas and the United States Virgin Islands in the opening round of the 2024-2025 CONCACAF Nations League. The Barbados Football Association this morning announced the 23-member squad, which includes six new faces. CBC's Anne Margaret Rich Boyce reports from the team's training session at the BFA Willy Turf. The Barbados senior men's national football team were hard at training ahead of two crucial matches in the CONCACAF Nations League, which begin on Saturday. The Tridents will be without several of their overseas-based players. However, head coach Kent Hall has set two major targets for this squad, promotion back to League B and topping the group. In rankings, we are, we are the team that the expectation would be on to, to top the group. Um, we understand that comes with a certain amount of pressure, but that is the nature of the environment. So in the end, um, we got to be ready to rise to that challenge. Um, I said it's, it's still early in terms of the, my tenure and, and working with my staff and the players. So I know we still got a lot of areas to improve on um, and a lot of a lot of aspects that we can add to how we want to play that we haven't really been able to get to but um, nonetheless we recognize that um, it's a results environment and so we have to focus on on trying to get those results um, and we have set that target of topping the group and getting us back into league b hall has named a youthful 23 member squad with several players receiving maiden call-ups for the first round matches Former captain Hayden Holligan and Carl Hinkson have returned to the team having missed the opening games in the FIFA World Cup qualifying tournament. Thierry Gill remains unavailable as he recovers from injury, while there is no place for Paradise striker Armando Lashley or Wimmerfield's players Nadre Butcher, Akeem Hill and Elijah Downey. Hall explained his rationale behind the selection process. Every player with a Barbados passport is eligible. Um, experience has a certain value, but also it's down to what you can do on the pitch. And in any given moment, players will demonstrate certain quality. Um, we know also that the national, the international environment is, if you if you can't compete physically, you can't compete, right? And so the main thing is you have to get players who are up to the physical demands of international football. The team is set to depart the island on Thursday for St. Croix with their first match against Bahamas on September 7th. And Mark Goodridge Boyce, CBC Sports. Thanks, Anne Mar Justin Paris took six wickets as Nichols, Bacon, Combermere dominated Christchurch Foundation on day one of their BCA under-15 semi-final match at Briar Hall. Set into bat, Foundation were bowled up for 106 in 40 overs. Paris snapped up six for 18, while Asher Branford top scored of 26. In reply, Combermere reached 81 for one at stumps, trailing by 25 runs. Paris is not out on 37. Meanwhile, in the other semi-final at Lears, the bowlers also dominated. Jaden Payne and Jatari Hines took three wickets apiece as St. Leonard's boys bowled out Milo Lodge for just 49 runs. Payne finished with three for one and Hines three for 12. In reply, St. Leonard's were bowled out for 70, a lead of 21 runs. So Nico Sargent snapped up six for 23 and Jadon Bell four for three. Batting a second time, the Lodge School are 74 for three in their second innings, an overall lead of 53 runs. 
Well, it was celebration time this morning at the Granley Adams International Airport as the triumphant Barbados Under-17 team returned home from the Cricket West Indies Rising Stars Championship in Trinidad and Tobago. The Signia Globe Financial Inc. Barbados side retained the regional two-day title following another dominant performance and they narrowly missed out on completing the double after rain forced their must-win 50-over match against the host to be abandoned. Trinidad and Tobago finished on 20.2 points, Barbados were second on 17.6, and Ghana third on 14.4 points. Coaches Dexter Toppin and Nemo Wynn commended the players on their consistency. In a tournament where that you won last year and to come back this year, it's always going to be difficult. So I'm very pleased with the boys and I give the boys all the credit. They had a start with preparation. And I think the boys really went through the drills and the preparation very well. And then when we get to Trinidad, we plan for the competition very well also. The boys really adhere to the call. And I think that in the future is very bright for Barbados cricket. There's one or two things that we need to, to do as far as these boys is concerned. Not only these boys, but we can look at the under 19s won this year, the under 15s, and now the under 17 won again this year. This is very good for Barbados cricket, but there's still one or two things you know maybe need to look at. And once we could get these things in place, I think that Barbados cricket would really stand the course and it will always dominate in, in regional cricket. They were an easy group to deal with, approachable, and the discipline on and off the field, you know, was extremely well. Well, Captain Joshua Dorn said the team spirit was vital to their success. The team played really hard for it. Three weeks that we were there, both competitions. Um, you know, the rain was a bit sickening at some points. Uh, we really, really wanted to forget to play, but things are about control, so we just stick to what we could control. Obviously, the house and the guys, but you know, most of the fellas play for Barbados Youth in the local tournament, so. It wasn't really hard for, for the guys to, to, really, to really blend in and, and, and get to know each other. Because we, we, we have played with each other for a, a long while, so we have known each other and stuff like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't really hard. Yeah, congratulations once again to the entire team. That is the first half in sports. When we come back, we've got lots more. Wendy, it's back over to you. Thank you so much, Damien. Up next on CBC's Newsnight, The Business Report. In tonight's business report, young artist Mackenzie Bavell says more live performances are on her agenda for the remainder of this year. She tells the Yes Business Report the month of September has been dedicated to live art at Platinum Coast Cigar Lounge, Lime Grove, St. James. Trevor Thorpe caught up with the artist today. Sales and making effective connections are high on the list for young artist Mackenzie Bavell. And she tells the Yes Business Report September is live art month for her and the foot traffic here at the Platinum Coast Cigar Lounge is encouraging. We're all looking to see if we can go to a couple more events for the year, have some more live performances as well as stage some more design aspects of what I do. And I wanted to do a product, new product line that I will announce later that will have a lot to do with the shop. Ms. Buffell says she's on her own now, but credits the training and the teachings from the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme for getting her to this stage of her development. In terms of training, yes, has taught me better, more on the business side, but the art is kind of where I specialize. She gave details on the thinking behind the month-long initiative. The theme currently is Icon, being that is the series. So the series with this particular painting, we'll be going with the theme of kind of like a church, church aesthetic. So we're starting to do some details at the cathedral windows, as well as the locket at the bottom. She says today's effort is a continuation of the roadmap she has been following, but much attention will be paid to detail. For this month, we're having a plan of getting in some more of our series icon. It would have heard on our Instagram or the last time that we had spoke. So today we're starting on number seven on the list. And this one will be called Celestial Body. All of you worship in that name. But for the entire month, we'll have at least four to six paintings with little drawings in between. 
each journey planned from step one to step two, which would be the painting. I will look into do more detailed work this time. The artist admits the live art initiative for September is not an easy task and will keep her busy. Well, I'm hoping to make some connections, make some sales, obviously, and as well as bringing more life to my paintings, adding more detail, adding more personalized base art. The live art show and exhibition runs from 10.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Monday to Saturday. Trevor Thorpe for the Yes Business Report. In other business news, national hero, the right excellent Robin Rihanna Fenty is the new face of the Jadoa fragrance by Dior. The Barbadian songstress who replaces actress and spokeswoman Charlize Theron was officially unveiled in a short campaign advert. The ad shot in the Palace of Versailles shows the fusion between the pop idol and the legendary perfume. Luxury goods company LVMH, who owns Dior, refers to the campaign as a celebration of the Dior dream in unison with the extravagance of a total star and universal woman. It adds bringing Jadot and Rihanna together is just the beginning of a new dream in gold. Well, that's it for tonight's business. We'll take a break and be back with the weather. And we say good evening to Carrie Ann O'Neill. What's the weather picture, Carrie Ann? Good evening to you, Wendy, and good evening, everyone. In the forecast for tomorrow, the sun is expected to rise at 5.47 and will set at 6 minutes past 6. The first high tide is expected at 4.34 in the early morning, the first low at 10.30 a.m. Those seas, they are smooth to moderate in open water with swells peaking at 1.5 meters. The winds coming in from the east, northeast to the east, and they're peaking at 30 kilometers per hour. Press here in Barbados tonight, we can expect a mix of clear and cloudy skies along with just a few brief scattered light showers. And over the next three days, fair to partially cloudy skies along with just a few brief showers can be expected. And we say welcome back to Damien Best. Thanks so much, Wendy. Well, rain only allowed a portion of the matches to be played so far in the round of 16 of the Barbados Road Tennis Open competition. Playing at Belfield in St. Michael, four ladies' matches were completed, but only one for the men. Belfield, the venue. Kiana Holder in the far court versus Estefine Holder. Kiana down a game here. Too much power would be her undoing in the first game, losing 21-18. The second was much more productive, and Kiana would put Estefine under the pump. Forearm drive on target and deadly. In fact, Estefine couldn't get going in the first game, and Kiana took her to market, inflicting a sow. 21-4. Tied at one all now, a third game to win it. Momentum with Kiana. Body shift to the excitement of the spectators. And the facial expressions told the story. It was becoming easier to pick a point of attack. Estefine did escape back-to-back -back souls using the angle to test the reach of her opponent, locking the score at 7-all. But once Kiana re-established control, it was smooth sailing into the quarterfinals, winning the contest 18-21, 21-4, 21-12. Kiana's mum was on court next. Kim Holder in the red shirt versus Alyssa Walcott. This was basically a no contest from the first point. Holder went from 14 to 8 to take the first game at 21-8. The second was over in a jiffy as well. Up 7, love. Kim would move into the quarters. 21-8, 21-6. Demolition job complete. On to the next one. Rachel Smith in the back. Had it relatively easy against Juliet Worrell. One of the longer rallies of the matchup. With Smith kept to the baseline, the two trading forearms before the angle proved too much for Worrell. 21-9 in the first. In the second, Worrell improved and did well to reach 12 before Smith wrapped up the match in two straight at 9-12. and 12. Marilyn Blunt and Shireen Ward in the red shirt will close out the women's round of matches. Blunt 
with the subtle change in pace and Ward anxious to come into the court and it pays off. Blunt has been making significant strides in the sport and she was up for the seesaw battle. Had to play the waiting game here as Ward looked to use power down the line off target and Blunt thankful for the gift. The first game, a nail-biting one, locked at 20 all at one stage with the tipping point late in the game where an unforced error could be detrimental to progress. 21-20 in favour of Blunt, wicked serve and Ward unable to return. 22-20 then, the advantage to Blunt, she goes up 1-0. On to the vital second, Blunt measuring her shots and Ward finding it hard at times to level up with the same intensity. Even when she had an opening to punish Blunt, a fault shot ruined the intent. Blunt eventually stopping Ward at 21-18. These two really giving the spectators plenty food for thought, battling hard. In the end, Blunt moving on to the quarterfinals on the error from Ward. Well done to both players. In the men's showdown, Dario CR7 Hines vanquished veteran Marson Johnson at 15 and 15. It was really an exhibition from Hines as he tries to live up to his status as a potential title contender. Take nothing away from Johnson. He still gave the youthful Hines some teachable moments. This was a prime example. Leaves Hines frozen in time. Beautiful sight. Johnson unable to produce the father's correction as fatigue set in and Hines into the next round on a night of road tennis where Rain had the final say. And that action continues tomorrow night at the same venue. Now some sad news to end sports night. The motorsport fraternity has lost a stalwart of over 50 years. Biddy Barber, the brains behind the Mud Dogs off-road rally, passed away today. CBC extends condolences to her family and members of the Barbados Rally Club. Well, that's it for Sports Tonight. Wendy, it's back over to you. Thank you so much, Damien. Thanks for viewing. Do enjoy the rest of your evening.